We honor their connection to the land and rivers and respect the importance of the environment to our strength as a community. And with that, um, late items, and we're going to have an update from the city manager on waste management as a late item uh, going forward. And if it's okay with council, we'd like the agenda adopted with that short presentation at the end. Councillor Morrison and Councillor Renwick, all in favour? Carry. Thanks very much. Okay, adoption of the minutes of the previous meetings, the committee of the whole meeting on June 28th. I'll move. Moved by Councillor Woodward, Councillor Charwood, second. Any questions or comments? Hearing none, all in favor? Thank you. <clears throat> so at this point in time, there's a 15 minute period where we permit comments from the public. So if there's somebody in the, in the audience that wishes to come forward and uh, speak to council, they're welcome to do so right now. Come on. And just give us your name and where you live yeah. and your topic. And we won't act on your ideas tonight, but if there's something comes out of it the council wants to bring forward at a future meeting, they'll do, they can okay. do so. Have the option. Okay. Um, so I'm Anita Johnson, and I live in Uphill. And I am here tonight to talk about bears in Nelson being shot and killed due to unsecured garbage. On September the 9th, I witnessed a dead mother bear and one of her young cubs being loaded into the conservation officer's truck. This was horrific, traumatizing, and heartbreaking. I was informed by the attending police officer that there was a considerable amount of garbage on the ground where the bears were shot and killed, and this is infuriating. Shooting bears simply because it is cheaper and easier than implementing an adequate bear smart waste management program is barbaric and disgraceful. It is the responsibility of local government to regulate and manage wildlife attractants within their jurisdiction. Bears in Nelson are being killed at an alarming rate in direct relation to being fed with attractants. Nelson's bylaws address wildlife attractants, but bylaws alone are useless. Without follow-up enforcement and without other forms of appropriate waste management solutions in place, such as bear-proof bins. Many residents in Nelson are unable to manage their garbage due to a lack of a garage, a shed, or a freezer to store it in. It is unreasonable to expect people to store stinking garbage inside their homes or to purchase freezers for this purpose. Consequently, garbage is being stored outside in non-bear-proof bins or outbuildings, leading to conflicts with bears and property damage, which usually in Nelson results in the bear's tragic death. Downtown, bears are getting into dumpsters that are over full or left open with the same result. According to the Bear Smart program, if curbside pickup is in place, residential and commercial bear-proof containers are the most important tool in minimizing bear conflicts. Weekly garbage pickup alone is not a solution. Whether you have three days worth of garbage or 10 sitting in your bins, it's still a wildlife attractant. Food cyclers may help to reduce organic waste in our garbage, but they do not address garbage that can't be recycled such as large bones and grease, fruit pits, plastic wrappings from meat, diapers, and used cat litter, which are all wildlife attractants. There are significant ongoing costs for households to run and maintain food cyclers, and there is no way to gain cooperation from households to use them at all if they choose not to. I'd like to call your attention to a petition signed by over 21,000 concerned residents, taxpayers, neighbors, visitors, and potential visitors to Nelson, insisting on bear smart changes to Nelson's wildlife attractants and waste management programs and policies. These comments left by signers of the petition speak volumes. The city has been grossly neglectful in their bear safe practices. Dead bear capital of BC is no way to promote tourism. A stain on your reputation. 
Having lived in Nelson for over 40 years, I know this shocking issue has been brushed aside and ignored for far too long. The research has been done. There is a wealth of readily accessible information to guide communities in becoming bear smart. I encourage everyone here to visit bearsmart.com and learn about the program if they have not yet done so. Other cities as close by as Castlegar are proving that there are workable and effective solutions to managing garbage, fruit trees, and other attractants. It's time for Nelson to do the same and make implementing Bear Smart policies a priority. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Anybody else that has a comment for council on a, preferably a different subject mm -hmm. if you have it, so that we get everybody into the 15 minute time period that we have. Uh, do you want me to talk or not? Um, depends on what your topic is. I'm talking about the food cycle. This is a different subject. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Bruce. Hi. Thanks for having me. And you're Bruce, uh, I, what's your full name? Bruce Edson. Edson, and you live in Nelson? Yep, I grew up in Nelson. I live outside of Nelson, Shore Acres. You, li you live in Shore Acres? Yep. Okay. Yep. And you're here to talk to Nelson Council about the food cycle. This is correct. So I've, uh, I've sat on the Regional Resource Recovery Advisory Committee for many years. Okay. I've been an advocate. I've been sat before, uh, talked to this council a number of times on this issue. I'm not sure if you remember or not, but... Um, so I'm going to be talking to you again tonight, and I appreciate you listening to me. It'll just take a few minutes. Yeah. Thanks. So, um, all right. So the economic and environmental rationale and model used by the City of Nelson food cycler proposal, based on the two pilot projects run by the city, appears to have significant fundamental errors and modeling issues that have resulted in what I feel is catastrophically flawed data and resultant assumptions. As such, the heavily replied, relied upon economic and environmental rationale for the food cyclers do not appear to be even marginally supported. This issue is important to bring up again at this juncture for a few reasons. Primarily, any real organics management program must be both effective and economically sustainable. And there are or will be significant real world consequences if, if it is not. Put simply, it will fail. The wildlife issue, including rats in Nelson, has been a growing year-on-year -year problem and has now come to a crisis point. Residents now expect an effective and financially sustainable organics program, not an experiment, not a trial, and especially not one based on faulty premises. Waste fees have been going up in an attempt to fund the organics program, while a food cycler proposal still remains defined as a pilot. Now, city representatives have indicated that they are considering a return to weekly pickup. Switching to weekly alone would likely eliminate any economic case for the food cycler proposal, even if the issues in the rationale mentioned here are not addressed. If errors in the rationale are addressed, the food cycler proposal clearly becomes both environmentally and economically uncompetitive and most likely untenable by a large margin. I feel that this issue should be taken seriously as the city considers budgets and grapples with the necessity of crafting real, cost-effective, and economically sustainable solutions for both the wildlife issue and organics diversion. I will be available to identify these modeling issues to anyone who wishes to confirm them, but due to time constraints, we'll not go into detail here unless requested. I'm here to ask that the city and councillors once again to strongly consider moving to weekly organics pickup program, as has been recommended by a number of professional locally commissioned studies on the subject and is being done in neighboring communities such as Castlegar. Castlegar is now a, bear, now a bear smart community. Alternatively, I ask you to engage an independent professional to review, correct, or remodel the food cycler modeling. The modeling needs to contain legitimate comparisons, be accurate, well-supported, referenced appropriately, reviewed appropriately, and adhere to established professional best practices and standards. It needs to clearly show the environmental, economic, and functional benefit of considered options. Additionally, the program needs to be shown to be clearly financially sustainable and not primarily rely on grants, as is largely the case with the current proposal. 
In my opinion, the current model is not appropriate, not an appropriate metric to base any policy development or public spending on and needs to be discarded or reevaluated. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. Anybody else that has would like to come up and speak? Okay. And are you speaking to a different subject or the same subject? Same subject. What, um, we're past our time, but if you're short and sweet, then fair enough. Okay, yeah. My name is Kimberly Hyatt, and um, I'm a resident of Nelson and have been for about 25 years. I just wrote the paper last week uh, concerning the bear issue. One of the things I have to bring to you is the question that will illustrate the fact that it doesn't, the, the, the way our garbage is dealt with presently doesn't work. If somebody calls in to mention that somebody has left their attractants out, nothing happens. The person that is doing the bearware work up the corridor between Nelson, who handles Nelson and Caslow has had a thousand conversations with people with absolutely no change in behavior. In fact, it, it, she comes back and finds after a discussion that the person is doing the same thing. People are as they are and we need a better system in place and it's not weekly pickup. And if, if, if any of you care to study uh, the, the, the Bear Smart website, it's well laid out. The work has already been done. And I would say that Nelson has just been really negligent in this. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's so upsetting to be there when a bear gets shot out of the tree. Everybody has a different opinion as to how these animals should, inter should interact. But the reality is we're living in a wildlife corridor. And everybody here, I'm sure, has, including me probably, I've missed some hazelnuts, has some bear attractants in their yard. We're all cupable. It's not any, it, each individual affects that. But the fact that we live in a bear corridor means that we have to be, like, behave responsibly. People come here to be interfaced with the wild. And there is no electric fence. We don't live in a national park. So, you know, I, I encourage you strongly to please take note of this. This just has to, to uh, move in the right direction. And again, look at the Bear Smart um, information. Thank you. Thank, very, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, we're just about on the edge of time here. If there's somebody else that has a moment or something quick they want to put on the floor, you're welcome to do so. Okay, hearing none. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. <coughs> Up next, we have a presentation from Nelson Soccer Association. I beg your pardon? The air oh, the air I'm sorry. I beg your pardon. You're up next. Sorry. Yeah. Come on up. Come on up. Yeah. Uh, thank you for having us here today. Yeah. This, I am Major Kevin DiBiagio. I'm the commanding officer of the Nelson Air Cadet Squadron. I have with me two of my senior cadets, Flight Sergeant McIntosh and Flight Sergeant... Ward. <laughs> We've been online for so long, I forget their names. <laughs> but we're back in person now. So this is a continuation of our annual inspection from last spring. We had Cal as our reviewing officer. And at the time, I had a presentation for him as for, for city council, you know, since he was representing the mayor and council, of this picture that, that I acquired. And at the time, he suggested that I bring it to the to the entire council. A um, few things about the Nelson Air Cadets. We are finally growing again. We're meeting in person. And this is our 70th, our 70th year in Nelson. The squadron was formed in October 1952. So we've been running continuously in Nelson for the youth of Nelson and area for 70 years. So we want to say thank you to the council for their support over the last 70 years um, and, and, the, and the community. A few things about this picture. This picture shows one of the Air Cadet 182 tow planes that we also use for giving cadets rides as well as towing our gliders. The, the artist who, wrote, who, who created this picture, he lives in Ontario and he paints Air Cadet gliding pictures for fundraising for the Ontario Air Cadet League. 
talking to him, myself and several other people said, can we get something for BC? And he said, yes, I'll do one. Send me pictures. So part of the pictures we sent him for reference photos included a picture of Nelson. So the, the aircraft parked in Nelson. So this is actually at the Nelson Airport. The pilot, or the guy who, uh, who did the painting, he's also a pilot, and he had flown into Nelson several times, and he had nothing but amazing things to say about this airport. So besides this reminding council about, about the air cadets, it also reminds council about, about the airport, the airport in Nelson. It is an amazing little gem we have here. I'm a pilot from Trail. I fly in here all the time. If any pilot wants to fly somewhere, I'd, I'd go for lunch. Nelson is the perfect place because <laughs> we're within walking distance of how many excellent restaurants on Baker Street. Normally, we fly to an airport, we get some, we get some greasy burger or chicken wings. <laughs> Here, we get Mexican, we get Indian, we get North American, anything we want down Baker Street. So, as I just want you to remember that as the airport that you have within walking distance of downtown is an amazing thing. And the air cadets support the airport and I want to remember, I want to remind council that it's, it's an amazing thing and it attracts people to the area. Thank you. But anyway, so that's, that's my little spiel. So if I could have somebody come up and yeah. receive this and just don't mind, I'll take a couple of pictures too. Yeah, yeah, just come on up here to the... Uh... Oh, perfect. Yeah. Come on up here for the front. Yeah. In the middle. Yeah. Slide up through the middle here, guys. You do a little shimmy. Yeah. Thank you. I just... Oh, just the kidding? Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. It's about them. It's not about me. Okay. Thank you. All right. There's a little bit of glare, unfortunately. Oh, well. Tilted, yeah. There we go. There That's we go. Better. Thank you. Got it. Thank you very much. <laughs> and yes, flight surgeon, I believe you have a. Oh, thank you. Your patches. Yeah, we have a couple of patches for, for you, sir. And anyone, and if you want more, we can get more. Thank you very much. Thank and you. if anyone has, has kids aged 12 to 19 who are interested in aviation, citizenship, and leadership, we meet Wednesday nights at the Eagles Hall. You can apply online at cadets.ca. <laughs> Good catch. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Where can we leave this where we won't break it like we did in um, July? <laughs> just, yeah, I just sat it over there on the side. Ginger, maybe, maybe, maybe Ginger can in the back. In the back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. We appreciate You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. Thank you. Um, so we'll backtrack a little bit here. So next up is Nelson Soccer Association. So just come on up to the table there, and I think you have your PowerPoint probably set up, have you? Yep, fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thanks very much for coming to present to us. Just let us know who you are, and council has got a package here in front of them of your presentation, so... Okay, um, my name is Tim Woldridge. I'm a teacher in town at LVR. Um, I'm also a coach, a soccer dad, um, and a board member with the Nelson Soccer Association. So I'm here today with the 10 minutes I have uh, to make a pitch for um, rejuvenating our uh, facilities uh, and replacing our current indoor facility with um, a new facility. Um, am I okay to advance my slides, or are you the guy? Okay. Um, well, I'm going to talk because time is uh, crucial. <laughs> um, so we, we currently have an indoor facility that we have an arrangement with the city uh, with. And uh, in the last couple of years, we've determined that it's, it's time for some renewal. Uh, and we've come to this conclusion for a variety of uh, reasons, uh, growing population base and membership with the Nelson Soccer Association. Um, We've also determined that our shoulder season is somewhat uh, being impacted by climate change and smoke. Uh, so we've determined that a new facility is something that we need to explore. You're good to go. Okay, okay so yeah. wonderful. Just making sure you... It looks there. different on my screen. Um. <laughs> is it on yours? 
If you click for me, I'm just going to talk. You're a beauty. Thanks, okay. Gabe. There we go. Just say click. <laughs> um, okay, if you would, uh, yeah, there we go. So current state of our sport in Nelson is, uh, and all the figures that I'm presenting uh, to you are the current figures. So if you'd click for me. Fantastic. Okay. Um, we have approximately 1,000 uh, registered players uh, today. Normal, our normal sort of numbers are 1,200 to 1,500. We're experiencing a bit of a COVID uh, rebound. But um, those are members who play on a very consistent basis. Uh, those are members that are, go from five years old to uh, 95 years old, uh, and they play on a regular basis, and those are our members. And these are the people that we're thinking about as we look to uh, facility uh, rejuvenation. If you would click the slide, please. Thanks. Um, so we have three, uh, whoa, okay, that's different from mine. Okay. Um, so we have some challenges uh, at the Nelson Soccer Association. One back. One back. Oh, one back. There you go. There we go. There we go. Um, we have uh, three streams uh, that we consider our members. Uh, we have a children and youth stream. They play recreationally. They play uh, many times a week. These are approximately 800 players. Uh, we have... Uh, an adult group of players who play down at Lakeside and in our indoor facility throughout the year. And then we have our high-level players in what's called the REP program. And these are our very committed uh, players and who have aspirations for playing uh, at a very high level. And we have about 200 to 300 um, members who would be in that last category. Um, if you would click for me. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Um, so we, we've determined that we have some challenges going forward, and like other sports, uh, we are experiencing in Nelson a rising membership that we're um, projecting into the future and realizing that our current facility isn't necessarily going to match that. Um, we have a desire in our um, association to meet high-level coaching needs, and that's sort of a Canada-wide thing as soccer becomes more and more um, Canada's sport. Um, and this brings us to the, to the challenges that, that I'm here to, to speak to you today about. Um, our current facility in the winter, our indoor facility, uh, doesn't have the capacity that we feel uh, it needs to have to meet our membership. Um, our membership is keen to play year-round, um, and our indoor facility just can't meet that. Um, I mentioned climate change and smoke. Our shoulder season is suffering where we're having to cancel uh, sessions for kids um, and adults because of smoke. An indoor facility would um, address this. Um, and the last one is something that uh, we talk about a lot at the Nelson Soccer Association. We have a lot of players who uh, are looking to other communities to go to, um, namely Cranbrook, because they have uh, a bigger um, more soccer um, sort of specific facility, and um, we are losing players to those facilities. If you would click. Maybe one more time. Ah, there we go. Um, so I, I put a very smoky picture on the screen to that's a fire just outside of town. Uh, we've had closer days this year. We've had more um, in the last few years than we've had in our um, association's uh, memory, and we were worried about this going forward. Um, we've been in close contact with our um, friends in Cranbrook, and they say um, their dome facility somewhat uh, acts as a shoulder season and smoke season uh, way of, of continuing kids and, and soccer players to play. Um, this is a concern during our most busy of times when Lakeside Park is full, full, full. If you would click for me. Um, so this is us uh, looking forward to uh, a great indoor season at our current facility. Uh, that's sort of our schedule for our players. Uh, and this demonstrates quite uh, readily that we are at capacity. Uh, we turn, um, I'm here on behalf of the youth. Um, I'm not so concerned about the adults, but we are turning youth away. Uh, they're not getting the time on the pitch that they would like through uh, the winter season because we're at overcapacity. 
Um, we are exploring school gym use. Um, that's something that we're going forward doing and the Selkirk gym. Uh, but at the end of the day, we are uh, well, well, well over capacity. Um, if you click for me. So our vision is uh, a dome. That's the Cranbrook dome in the picture right there. Uh, they, they're acting as our uh, assistants as we go forward to look at um, a new facility. Um, my involvement in this idea came about from a weekend soccer trip to Cranbrook where we took about 200 players from Nelson to play in their dome um, because they had a dome. And I sat there and went, hey, this, uh, they have far less members than we do. Uh, it's not as soccer passionate a town as we are. Uh, and we're traveling to their dome and taking our restaurant dollars with us for a weekend of soccer to Cranbrook. Um, so I'm here today to ask for a feasibility study on a domed facility in Nelson. Um, We've done a lot of work with our membership and determined it needs to be in Nelson because our youth walk to soccer in town. We all see them doing it. Um, I presented to the RDCK and uh, have a letter of support from them. And we know that a dome in Nelson is, is the right fit and makes sense for our very large membership. Um, next slide, pretty please. Um, so we've done some preliminary work. Um, there's, uh, thanks to the Cranbrook folks, we have all the do dollars and cents of what a do dome facility costs, how easy it is to put up. Um, we are keen on a dome facility because it is cost effective. Uh, it's a safe, uh, good air environment for people to play in. And um, all the work has been done all around us. There are domes in many, many centers uh, in BC. Uh, the, the manufacturer is a Canadian manufacturer. So those uh, dollars and cents that you see there are current as of 2022 for a full-size pitch dome. Um, and I have all the specs that I can forward to folks from the Farley Group uh, who builds domes in Canada and do the Cranbrook Dome. We're looking at what's called a medium-sized dome, and that's the price tag that you see up there. Uh, we have the membership and the capacity to do the fundraising for uh, the cost of the dome. We're just looking for a partnership with the city uh, on the land portion. That's what we're keen on. Um, next slide. Uh, so without a feasibility study, these are, uh, this is just pure conjecture, but our membership has uh, run around town um, got excited going, looking at past uh, locations for domes. Uh, so that's uh, Mary Hall, uh, possible location there. Obviously a feasibility study will tell us if that's a good idea. Uh, next slide. Um, some of our membership think that putting a dome at Lakeside Park would be a brilliant idea. Um, that's a full-size pitch dome right there. Um, next one. Uh, Oh, that's me timing myself because I'm a good guy, sticking to 10 minutes. Um, that's a prospective uh, site brought to us by uh, some friends of our membership, um, the end of John's Walk. Uh, next slide, for please. And this is uh, some of our business friends in town saying there's a lovely piece of land available there uh, at the end of Railtown that would fit a full-size dome as well. Um, so these are prospective sites. We know that Nelson is land um, challenged, um, but we also know that we are excited about uh, a project like this. It would serve uh, many people in the community. Uh, we have the sports community uh, behind us with very little conversation as of yet. Track and field has come out of the woodwork saying, wow, we would love to run uh, our kids year round in a facility like that. Uh, we know the economic benefit of sports and sports tourism in town and these locations we think um, are, are prospective ones. And I know that the wisdom around uh, this room has more, more than we do. And that's why we'd like to enter into a feasibility study in partnership with the city to come up with a location. Um, the last thing I'll say is that uh, I got involved uh, when I saw the passion of the children in the community for the sport. I've never seen anything like it in all the places I've lived in Canada. Um, and I'd like to continue 
that enthusiasm and give the kids a place uh, to play going into the future. Um, and that's my time, I think. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, any questions? Councillor Lockenberg. Thanks, Tim. Um, very excited to, to see this proposal. I think it's, it would be fantastic if Nelson did have a soccer dome and understand that the track and field um, club would be excited to have this as well. And I noticed that some of the other domes, like in Cranbrook, do have like a, a batting cage. So maybe the baseball uh, community would love this too. Um, so couple, two questions. One is related to location. Mm -hmm. So we had something similar come before us with the, the climbing uh, community and, and a proposal request for land. One of the things in terms of the process they followed was they did undertake their own um, site survey feasibility study that they, they funded from membership fees to, to do this. I would maybe recommend having a look at that approach to it. Um, however, having said that, it might not be necessary because you have a limited number of choices in the city. Um, so now to my questions. First is the Mary Hall location to me looks very exciting. However, um, it's not clear to me from your presentation the size. Like, if, is this a medium size facility? Because it does cut right into the road and, and you'd have to excavate out that slope. So it starts to look, is it possible to contain it within the the footprint of that field that's there now? Um, so in, th great question. In consultation with our um, friends in Cranbrook and looking at the facility that they built, um, they've been very clear to us that if they could do their process again, uh, so they have a 70% sized pitch. They don't have a full size pitch. And they have said to us that if they could do it again, they would have built a full-size pitch. So um, the picture that we have is perhaps not wonderfully to scale, um, but some of our business partners have sat there going, this is, you know, we went out with some tape and measured, and, and that's approximately where a full-size pitch mm -hmm. would fit. The reason that we're keen on a larger facility than Cranbrook um, comes from our desire to be a bit of a hub. Uh, we're considered a hub in terms of expertise and production of players and membership, uh, but not in terms of our facilities. Um, one of the reasons that we're looking to, for a larger um, piece is, is to attract um, bigger tournaments. So we are unable to attract provincial tournaments as it is now. We, we can't have bigger tournaments because we don't have enough pitches in town. Um, so Cranbrook has said to us, if you take on another pitch, make sure it's a full-size one. So that's why the picture looks as, as it is. Um, Having been in consultation with them, it is very easy to lay out the pad because these are uh, somewhat temporary structures. Mm. So you don't have to go to all the extents to lay down a pad that you would for a, a fixed structure. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have some mums and dads who are part of contracting businesses who are members uh, at the NSA, and they said, oh, this is something that we could uh, work out with the city in terms of size of pitch. Right. And I have heard, I'm a new, mem uh, new board member, that back in the day there was uh, an idea to put a, uh, a pitch in that very spot, and it did require some work to make it a more sizable piece of land. Okay, well then... Makes sense, all yeah, of that. Yeah, it, it, uh, it does. So that leads to my second. So the, the second option to me seems to be the lakeside location. So two questions related to that are, number one... What does, uh, how are these things um, when it comes to like water damage or flooding? Like if that field floods, will they be damaged? And related to that, sort of related to that, is what does it do to the permeability of the surface? Because right now that field provides some drainage and, yeah. and so forth. So, would it so I'm not an engineer, but um, I've got, we've got members who've sat with me and talked about, hey, you know, this is how we could put up a bubble just like Cranbrook. Um, so the, um, the bubbles can go up and down very quickly. Um, it's, it's, uh, they have a nice video on their website of a bubble going up and down in a relatively short period of time. Um, strange weather is part and parcel of our future, um, I think. So these structures can be made um, 
safe in a short period of time. It's literally f uh, flipping a switch and they come down. Um, they're on the prairies. These facilities are everywhere. They're um, at the top of Canada. There's, there's some in the Northwest Territory. So they can withstand um, harsh weather conditions. And you can have a permeable um, base to them and have water flow under them or around them because they are um, an inflatable bubble. Um, yeah, and there's a lot more specs in the handout I've just passed over there. Thanks. OK. Thank you. Councillor Woodward. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, so uh, I have two questions. One, one is the longevity of the product and the investment versus the longevity. OK. Um, so maybe I, you know, um, I was I've, looking through here. I, I'm sorry, I don't have time to read it all. No, 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 it's OK. Um, so um, my understanding is that the physical, the skin of the structure is good for uh, between 25 and 35 years. The steel membrane is, is uh, good for much longer than that. Um, in terms of a uh, cost outlay, these are very affordable, <clears throat> excuse me, for an association like us. Um, if you look at the price tag of a, of a fixed building, uh, this isn't, that's not something the NSA could take on. But we look at the um, outlay of money uh, for a structure like this and the impact on the community and the uh, tourism dollars that would come to town and the uh, rise in membership that we would experience. We're, we've, we're using our Cranbrook friends a lot and they're giving us a lot of uh, good feedback on um, how durable the structure is. Um, and they, they're guaranteed for 25 years, 25 to 35 years. Uh, and the folks in Cranbrook are telling us that um, because of our mild winters here and um, not inclement weather that they experience in Ontario where they're manufactured, uh, that they, they feel that their dome will far, far outlive uh, its guaranteed time frame. Okay. Um, and that excites us too. Um, when I was a little boy in Saskatchewan, I went for tennis lessons in a dome, and uh, I'm not a young guy anymore, but that dome is still there, and it looks a lot better than I do. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. And right. my, the follow-up question was, yeah. you spoke of uh, climate change and wildfire, and I think we have to consider ember showers in, in that equation. And if, you know, if we're talking over the next, say, 10 years, it's not, uh, it's gonna happen. It's like, yeah. we're gonna have a fire very close by our town. Um, so I'm just wondering about how much they can withstand in terms of embers and. Um, great question. Um, this, this did come up in a conversation I had with the association in Cranbrook. Um, so it, it looks, uh, when you go up to these structures, they look like uh, a big giant tent. Mm -hmm. Uh, you rub your hands on it, and then it doesn't feel like a tent. Um, they are very, very durable structures. Uh, my understanding is it's got a sort of a Teflon-y coating, mm -hmm. um, and they, um, as far as I know, and the spec sheets I've read, that embers landing on them, uh, it would have to be a very large one to create any damage because of the nature of the fabric, because it sheds everything. Okay. Um, I used to live in the Northwest Territories. We had a dome um, in the Arctic and forest fires all around us. And we used it uh, in that remote community as our um, protection from the elements, um, our clean air center our cooling center, and we had fires all around us. Um, they come with sensors to monitor weather uh, events and occurrences. So there's a 24-hour hotline that you call if you're worried about your dome, and then they, they tell you when it's a good time to deflate, okay. which will protect it. Um, and as a person who's lived uh, and used one as a center for clean air, um, we had fires around us, and it was good to go. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Page. Thanks, Tim, for bringing this to City Council. It's good to see you again. We saw you at Rec Commission. <laughs> my, uh, my question is fairly simple and along the lines of, I think, what we've discussed before at that commission is now with uh, the letter of support from Recreation to conduct a feasibility study and uh, uh, allocation of some RDCK staff time to help 
shape that and ensure that it meets the, the criteria or the expectations of, of at least the RDCK's local government. Is there appetite on your board to, uh, along the lines of Councillor Lautenberg, to now spend some of that money, work with those staff to, to take the first step in this process of, of firming up that feasibility study and, and seeing if this is something that needs to go further? Like, is that money you guys are willing to put a, aside and, and spend to take this project along the way? Yes, absolutely. Um, at our last um, board meeting, um, we discussed liberating some of our funds and um, not spending on some um, other items. Um, because we're a nonprofit, uh, our money is usually earmarked for uh, feeding directly back into the sport. But we've decided to sit and um, take a, some scissors to our budget and liberate some money because um, when I initially presented to the RDCK, the appetite uh, was there with our membership. And now because it's, uh, as a prairie boy, I'll use this analogy, it's like a tumbleweed and it's collecting more and more and more as it rolls along. So our membership is getting very excited. Uh, and yes, we, we have some money that we would like to spend in conjunction with others um, Yeah, to do a feasibility study. It's become more and more um, something that our association believes that we need to do. Yeah, for sure. Great. Thanks. Any other questions? Tim, I got a couple for you. I was okay. just looking at the actual number is not a big number in reality. Three million is, is it's, uh, I know I don't want to trivialize it by any means, but when you look at the dome itself, it's one point, just over a million, and the rest of it. So if you ever had to replace it, you'd have the foundation would be yeah. similar, et cetera, the turf and so on. And I can see a large chunk of this project could probably come around in donations as a matter of fact like gravel seating nets scoreboards stuff like that would be take a fair chunk off it um <clears throat> the other question i have for you and it's probably worth your while looking at it and the reason i bring this up is a project like this would not be totally out of the question to go to referendum for and the reason i say that is um because i think your catchment area goes into areas e f h and g which is a large geographical area, and that kind of money spread over that number of taxpayers could potentially be done through referendum. Um, your membership goes all the way up Slocan Valley, um, yeah. down to Wyre Salmo, right up to yeah. Caslo. Um, so you're talking about a, quite a large population there to potentially um, support a project like this here going to Yes. It'll be worth your while, I think, having this conversation with each one of those directors as well and see if, the po if that's possible, because that may be your quickest way to success. Yeah. Um, the, the figure on the PowerPoint for the, the dollar figure, um, when we look at that, uh, it's not daunting to us at all. Um, yeah. In Cranbrook, all of the... Um, ground preparation, um, physical labor to put it up, was the community itself. Yeah. Um, the soccer association was only on the hook for the physical structure itself. Exactly. Um, and we know that the community that we live in and the membership that we have, uh, we're not daunted by the dollars um, I mean, I could all. see this. I could see this happening quite... I mean, I don't want to speak for the other taxpayers, but I can tell you right now for $3.4 I'd vote for that as a taxpayer because if you were to spread that out among your in your catchment area, that would not be a big ticket item for the average taxpayer to deliver this product. And I really think that's something you should look at. And um, I just want to go back. I coached soccer for 15 years in Nelson. And in my first time I ran for election, I was a one issue candidate then, and that was to get new soccer fields built in Nelson. And we actually got those. The new fields are the ones that we built down there. But I think this is an amazing uh, proposal that is very doable. And it's, but it's definitely doable if you were to include your catchment area for Nelson Soccer. Um, I, I like it when the mayor says that it's definitely doable. That gets me pretty excited. No, no question, it's, it's doable. 
and everybody's a player in it, similar to you know sharing on the, sharing on the cost. You know, all of your all of your participants would be a a player in that. Um, I think that's something definitely that we will explore going forward. Absolutely. Um, we we do know that. Um, one of the struggles for us as an association is we do know that Nelson is, um, I don't want to use this phrase, but I've heard it used before, land poor. Yeah. Um, we do know that this is a large structure in, in some uh, residents' eyes, but we do know that um, this is a very passionate sports town. Um, our membership makes up almost um, a tenth of the population, um, and that's just people playing all the time, all the time. I also know from traveling as a coach for, uh, throughout the province uh, and into Alberta with my team that um, we are gradually um, struggling in terms of having the same facilities as other uh, communities. And soccer is the fastest growing sport uh, in the world. And the kind of like when the Raptors uh, won the yeah. thing, everybody was into basketball yeah. for a while. Um, yeah, we're sending both our national teams to world competitions, and it's because uh, people are very, very passionate about yeah. this sport. Well, even having the small indoor facility has made a difference to the, yes, absolutely. To the athletes as well. And there's a couple of them in the room tonight. Had We had a dome back in the day when Darren Davison was playing and Kevin Cormack. <laughs> God knows where they'd be today. <laughs> and United. Oh, well, Manchester <laughs> United, here we come. No bronze medal. Yes. Um, the, the last thing I'll, I'll say, because there are some soccer passionate people behind me, is uh, it was a very, um, I'm, I'm a newer resident to Nelson. Uh, I've been involved with sports my whole life. Um, it was a very proud Nelson moment at the last BC, BC Provincial uh, Tournament for um, rep soccer, because we took all of our teams, uh, every team in every category that had a rep team in Nelson went uh, to Burnaby yeah. to play. It's fantastic. And it yeah. was uh, a very, very proud Nelson uh, moment. Um, and it was amazing to see some kids put their feet on plastic pitches for the first yeah, time and yeah. um, yeah. go to the Christine Sinclair Center yeah. and have pictures yeah, taken yeah. in front of it. Artificial um, turf. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But as a, as a, as a newer person here, I felt bad that some of those kids didn't have the same opportunities as kids in other towns from the big cities. Yeah. Um, and I came back to Nelson with a desire to sort of address that and yeah, say absolutely. that, you know, we can compete yeah. with anybody. Yeah. Um, this facility is definitely doable. Yeah. So that's why I'm it's sitting doable. here. No question, yeah. yeah. Um, Tim, thanks very much uh, for taking the time to come to present to us. and. Um, we'll follow up with you and maybe there's a couple of ideas you got here from council and myself that maybe you can work with and I honestly believe you can pull this off. I, there's no question in my mind and it's, uh, it'll, be, it'll be awesome for the town to be able to bring in those tournaments. The economic spin-off is huge, not to mention the value that the athletes get from, from uh, having a proper facility to train in and having the Whitecaps program here doesn't hurt either, right? So yep. they may, they've made a big difference to our program as well. So. Um, I want to thank all of you for letting me have this opportunity. It's, uh, it's been a privilege, and uh, we're excited. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be in touch with you then. Thanks, Tim. Okay. Up next, we have the um, Climate and Energy Team and the Youth Climate Core Partnership. And Celia, you're coming to give us a presentation. Let us know who you are and who's with you, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Mel, you can hear the room. I can. Can you hear me still? Yes. Oh, there we go. That's great. Yeah. Hey. Welcome. Awesome. Thanks. Can't, can't quite read your name, so you might as well let us know who you are. <laughs> great. Uh, well, go Cecilia, ahead. do you want to start off? Is that all right? Uh, sure, Mel, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself to the room, and then we'll dive into the presentation. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you so much, everyone, for welcoming me into this space today. My name is Melissa Lavery. I am the coordinator for the Youth Climate Corps here in the West Kootenai. 
Um, I stepped into this role in August of 2021. And at that time, I had over a decade of experience working internationally in youth leadership and in the outdoor education and environmental education industry. And although um, my work has taken me to a lot of places, Nelson and its community has, um, yeah, it's been a home for me for the past seven years. And um, currently I am finishing my master's degree in environmental education and communication through Royal Roads. And this provides like a lens of place-based responsiveness to my climate mitigation and adaptation work that I do here through the Youth Climate Corps. So um, I'm very excited to be here today working um, with Cecilia and the climate and energy team on this really wonderful partnership that we've been cultivating this summer. Thank you so much, Thank Mel. You. <laughs> that's great. Um, so that's exactly right. We're here to talk a little bit about the engagement that we did throughout the summertime in partnership with the West Kootenai branch of the Youth Climate Corps. Um, Gabe, I'll get you to drive, <laughs> if that's okay. Um, so I think a good place to start is just thinking back actually to the first presentation that our team delivered to you all about the approach that we plan on taking to implement Nelson Next. And of course, that includes focusing on our largest emissions areas, as we know, but it also is really about how we engage the community on an ongoing basis. And so that was really um, a key part of that, was making sure that there is a special role for youth in the work that we do on climate action here in Nelson. You can jump forward. Um, so I just want to spend a moment uh, talking about the why behind we are so focused on young people in this work. Um, obviously, youth, as we heard this evening, this evening, excuse me, have a really unique stake with climate change. Um, we also know that they're feeling the impacts of that already today. And so I wanted to draw your attention to some research that was done here locally, actually out of Selkirk College, um, with students here in the pre-med, the rural pre-med program, who looked at what young people are experiencing around climate change and, and what they found is not surprising. Um, young people are very concerned about the future and I'm not gonna dive into each of the statistics that you see here, but just to say that this is something that we're aware of and that we are really, you know, wanting to bring young people into the work that we're doing. So Gabe, you can jump forward. And, and with that being said, there's really two key pieces of that work and one is in order to address youth inclusion in climate action, we need to take climate change seriously, which of course here in Nelson, we know that that is a, a priority of everyone here. Um, and the other thing is that the best way that we can do this is actually to bring them in and involve them in the work that we're doing. Um, so that includes our implementation work, but also in our decision making as well. So Gabe, you can jump on more. Um, that was really the starting point of the goal of this partnership with the, with the Climate Corps, is really about creating opportunities to meaningfully engage young people and also to support civic engagement and literacy. And that is really, you know, it's not a question as to whether or not we're working on climate change here. We are doing, you know, everything from building bike lanes to increasing our <laughs> renewable energy storage to administering many climate programs. But really, we need to help young people understand the role of local government, what we can influence, what we can't, where their role is in terms of advocacy. And that was really the foundation of the work that we were doing here. So I'm going to pass it over to Mel, uh, who's going to share more about the Youth Climate Corps, and then we'll get into some of the impact that the partnership had in the community. Thanks, Cecilia. Yeah, something that I really love about this program is that it was founded right here in Nelson, reflecting some of those priorities in climate work. And this program was created as a way to provide young people ages 18 to 30 with paid opportunities to connect with local environment, with community, and also their own potential when working toward climate goals. Um, it started in 2020 and it is hosted by a grassroots environmental non nonprofit, WildSite, and currently it actually runs here in the West Kootenai it runs also in Kimberly Cranbrook and in the 2023 summer season, we plan on opening um, at least two more, two more branches. If we can move on to the next slide, that'd be wonderful. So 
we work in four major project areas and essentially our selection process is distilled into three questions. And those are, is it good for the environment? Is it relevant to our community? And will it provide opportunities for a crew to learn and expand their skill set? We see these four project areas as keys to climate action implementation. And we focus on these areas because we know, as Cecilia said, that youth are uniquely positioned within climate work as these individuals um, at this age are positioned to take on roles of leadership within our communities now and also within the next decade. Um, I'll be talking about a few specific examples of these projects shortly, but first I'd really love to jump to the next slide and share our approach. So when we are hosting these projects within those four um, project areas, we like to think about um, what the crew needs to know in terms of skills, certifications, and then overall knowledge in addition to how they can progress with their understanding post-program and like helping support that process. In addition to this, we create opportunities for youth to convey their learning with the community because we believe that the more opportunities that we have to expand education within our community, uh, the more resilient we are throughout. Um, as you step into these leadership positions within our community, we wanna ensure that they have the skill set um, to take on unique responsibilities that are specific to our region. Um, we can go over to the next slide. We have some highlights of our past season below. On the left, we have Andrew here. He's at our Bannock and Bloom Agroforestry project, which we worked with uh, Sifco and Kolesnikov on. And he's stripping the bark off of um, a locally harvested cedar post that we use to protect our saplings. This project was amazing because it was a pilot project that hosted a diversity of co-benefits, including carbon capture, food security, and also a post-forestry environmental restoration pilot. Uh, in the center here, we have Zaina, and she's working on a project that we partnered with uh, Fortis BC for, and we performed a deep energy retrofit within Nelson on a Kootenai Society for Community Living residential unit. So she, right now, she's applying an outsolation layer after she's improved the, the vapor barrier, and after this process, they've actually been able to recycle most of the siding on that house. This project was really wonderful as it um, allowed the crew to learn about the house as a system, the um, basics of energy efficiency and also construction. And we also had this really fantastic talk from Natalie from the climate and energy team here about um, embodied carbon within construction and that stuck with our crew in many ways. On the right here, we have Annabelle and this is while we've been working on um, an educational partner's farm, Mr. Mercy's Mushrooms up in Caslow. And something that we really love to do while working with our permaculture partners uh, is to become acquainted with um, high density farming, food security needs, um, and also provisions within our, our area host. And in this particular instance, we also got to learn a lot about mycelial networks, which was really fun. All of these projects were selected. Um, if we, sorry, <laughs> um, back to the slide. Uh, all of these projects were selected because they provide opportunities for the crew to understand the diversity of industries present in Coonies and also the climate impact specific to this area. But um, if we jump to the next slide, uh, we also had the opportunity this summer to focus on things that weren't so physical, uh, so focused on physical labor. Uh, and that was with our, our uh, partnership with the climate and energy team. And we were able to promote some of the city's climate programs with this partnership. And some of um, the, the benefits of, of <laughs> this experience was really clear um, and resounding within our crew. Here, Madison has said that working with the city has um, made the work that they did in the field have more context as they were able to talk directly to the people in the community. Um, and they also received a lot of really positive feedback from their conversations um, that, that made them feel really empowered and also really 
convicted in what the city is doing for for their climate plan. I'm gonna uh, have Cecilia go into more depth about what our summer ambassador program uh, and partnership look like. Great, thank you so much, Mel. Um, yeah, so clearly the Youth Climate Corps is doing amazing work here in Nelson, which is why we were eager to partner with them. Um, what our ambassadors were doing was really just having those face-to-face -face conversations with residents about our climate plan and making sure that they know how they can participate in our climate programs that we offer today. So that began with a tour of City Hall where we gave them a workshop on Nelson Next. They learned about the really in-depth community engagement that went into building the plan as well as learning about you know the data that really underpins um, the robustness of that strategy so that was the starting point and then we provided some in-depth training for the crew members talking about our climate programs but also how to have meaningful conversations with residents who may or may not be motivated by climate change so you know lots of our residents just want to save money on their energy bills <laughs> or they're interested in having a healthy lifestyle so really finding for those entry points with people that they may not have already um, yeah, come in contact with somebody who is motivated by those particular things. So um, with that being said, I wanted to share some of the outcomes of the partnership. So the Climate Corps crew members had what we called meaningful conversations. There was over 200 of them. And those are the conversations that went beyond like, hey, how are you today? Enjoy the farmer's market. Those are where they really felt like they were able to connect with somebody, learn about them, and share um, information about the climate plan as well. And so we did see an increased participation in our programs across the summer. So we doubled the enrollment in the e-bike financing program over last year, which is tremendous. Um, we also saw increased enrollment in the home energy retrofits program, which is unusual given that it's summertime and normally we see an uptake, you know, going into the winter season. And we also had many people put their hand up to join the early adopters list for the uh, organics diversion program as well. So we can clearly see that there was a tangible impact from having these conversations with folks out in the community. Um, and then, of course, because this partnership is really built on a level of reciprocity uh, with these young people, uh, each of the crew members came away with a deeper understanding of local government and climate action. And they also were able to actually put their engagement skills into practice. And we know that these young people are going to go on to, you know, become early career professionals. And having that chance to really enhance their communication skills is something we're really proud to have supported. And yeah, I just wanted to share this photo with you because I think it, it really captures the spirit of what we were trying to do. Um, and I just see here such a genuine uh, level of engagement and like desire to connect here. And I, I snapped that photo kind of candidly. It's not staged. And I just thought that's, that captures really what this was all about here um, over the summertime. So we are looking at what we're going to do next year with the Youth Climate Corps. We're very much in the exploring what's possible stage, but what is certain is that we will continue to involve young people as we implement Nelson next. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's <laughs> awesome. Questions from council? Hearing none. Oh, oh there we go. There's one. <laughs> um, I just did I not say I was wondering how many people were involved in this program. How many no, sir, uh, Woodward, can you speak up sure. a little bit there? Sorry, please? I was just wondering, thank you for the presentation. I was just wondering how many youth were involved in this program. Yeah, so there was 14 youth, I believe, in the crew this year. Is that right, Mel? Uh, 12. 12. It felt like 14 at times. <laughs> yeah, there was 12 <laughs> youth that acted as the ambassadors. And so we had them swap out. So every one of them had the opportunity to kind of take on that role. So, and, and just yeah. supplemental, if you mind. Yeah, absolutely. How, how are you recruiting youth? How, do, how, are you, how are youth finding out about this program? That is a great question for Mel. <laughs> Did you hear Councillor Woodward? Can I paraphrase? Um, how are we recruiting? Is yeah, that like, the question? Yeah, how are you, how are you getting this, uh, this program out to young people? Yeah, we've been exploring a few different routes throughout the, we've had um, three iterations of cohorts 
so far. So we've been working with KCDS, CUNY Career Development Society, for uh, the past two co uh, two cohort cohorts with um, varying degrees of success going through the program. And then we've also been, um, this last cohort, we have been exploring um, timing with post-secondary and seeing how how successful that is but that that's that's something that we are exploring and trying to figure out like what is the best recipe to get local youth um engaged in applying for these pro programs thank you very much councillor morrison and councillor page um thank you um uh, councillor woodward sort of stole my last question <laughs> about how do you how do you sign up i'm just wondering if i guess i'm I'm no longer 30. I could divide it in half and maybe I could be two people and join. <laughs> um, but uh, I just want to say that I really enjoyed the Summer Ambassadors. I've been down at the market every Saturday and I always stop at the booth to talk. And they're really great because they're always like, so can we tell you about the program? And then I'm like, well, sure you can, but I think I know a little bit about the program. So, But it's just they're um, so forward-facing and they're not afraid to engage with if you happen to drift a little too close to the booth you're going to get asked would you like to hear about the program so it's really good because they do um, draw the people in um, to hear the story so I just I just think it's a great uh, program and we've got some great young people um, getting involved and they speak so passionately about it so mm -hmm. I'm not surprised that we're seeing these numbers of double of the people signing up for e-bikes double of the people stand looking at the retrofits and things like that so I just think it's an um, excellent program and I hope it continues and hopefully we get a whole nother good good bunch of recruits next summer again yeah oh and then my other question would be is do we have any winter programming or is it because this cohort age group 18 to 30 many of them will be of course going to university or maybe going to Selkirk College but is there anything that Say if they're going to Selkirk College here locally, as opposed to saying off to UBC or U of A, mm -hmm. um, do we have anything? Um, you're over my shoulder. I'm looking. At, I'm, I'm looking at over my shoulder. The um, to sort of keep them a little bit busy during the winter. Mel, do you want to take that question, or would you like me to answer? You got it. In the context of um, of the Youth Climate Corps programming specifically. We have experimented with going into December for our programming from uh, like September to December. Right now we are, um, just because of the way that our projects are lining up, we're leaning more toward a summer summer programming that aligns um, a little bit easier with those four project types that we, that we focus on. Um, we're still quite young too, so that that's evolving. But I would love to hear um, from Cecilia if there's plans for expanding the summer summer ambassadorship into winter months. Yeah, what I what I can speak to is just the partnership with Selkirk College that we currently have. So we do have a intern working with us right now doing research on the organics diversion program through MyTax. And that's something that we've identified as really adding value, both because we have tons of questions that we need answer to, but also because again, bringing young people into the fold and providing them with that, that career opportunity is really important for us. So consistently over the next couple of years, we will be bringing on young people to come and join us in that work. And then I know that the peak times for engagement will be the, that summertime. And we want to have a seasonal lens on the climate program. So as I mentioned, there's you know typically an uptake in home energy retrofits throughout the winter time. So as we kind of you know, enhance the implementation of our clan. We hope to have some really concrete seasonal programming around those <coughs> things. So, yeah, hopefully that, that clarifies things. Thanks. Councillor Page. Thanks. Well, I won't sing the praises. I appreciate all the great work you guys have done. One of the challenges I, I wanted to ask you about is, is meeting <coughs> people, meeting groups of people that are outside of that typical sphere of influence. And the market certainly... Mm -hmm. uh, one can envision would lead to a certain type of, of, of demographic mm -hmm. that might have maybe a propensity to already lean in that direction. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering if we're looking at the car show and having something there, uh, the Canada Day celebrations, finding mm -hmm. ways to have uh, an angle in there for, for mm -hmm. presentations. We've got a number of uh, music festivals that happen in the area from Jazz Fest to Tiny Lights to Shambhala and how mm -hmm. we can integrate and find places to uh, 
to support there. I know that's outside of the Nelson scope in particular, but I, I, I want to see how we can challenge ourselves to find those groups of people that aren't going to find us. Hmm. Yeah, th that's a great um, a great point, Councillor Page. And so this partnership was really designed as a pilot to see what's possible with the Youth Climate Corps. Like, does this work well for us? What type of impact would this have? Mm -hmm. And so one of the conversations we're having now is, since this was so successful and it was really limited to the farmer's markets because we know it makes sense for us to piggyback off of, you know, events that are already being organized around town, we would like to see more broad participation in all types of community events. You nailed it with the Canada Day example, for, um, for example, excuse me, because we had so many... Um, different groups put their hand up to say, would you like to join us this year? Because we saw that you have the Climate Corps and it'd be great if you could be there. And just because of the scope, we weren't able to do that this time, but we hope to do more in the future, of course. So, yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, Mel, uh, thanks very much, and Cecilia, thank you also. I had the pleasure of going up to the wildfire mitigation work this year, with the, and the, your team was up there and they did an outstanding mm. job for us. And we're really happy about the partnership that we formed with you, and we're hoping to continue that going forward. And it's thanks to Council here that, you know, we were able to create this, our climate group and our team that's upstairs dedicated to doing the right thing around the environment. And, you know, we step outside the box, but that's what we're about, right? We try new ideas, and we, but we do our homework, and we develop them properly. And, you know, uh, going back to the old way of doing things uh, is just not on our plate. Uh, you know, we want new and innovative ideas, more forward thinking. And we want people coming forward to help us with their ideas in a, in a manner that's going to improve them rather than try and tear them down. And I just want to bring to your, to your, if you look at the motto of our city, the motto of our city says forge ahead. And that's exactly what we're doing on the climate front and in many other areas of, of the work that we do. And Mel, we're so glad that you're partnering with us. And, Thanks to Carmen and our group upstairs for the great work you're doing on, on uh, working around the whole carbon output, et cetera. So thanks for doing that. We really appreciate it. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Celia. Thank you, Celia. Thank you, Celia. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Ginger, I think you've got the chair here. So Ginger Lester is our city's communications coordinator, and she's going to talk to us about, guess what? <laughs> Communications. <laughs> Thanks, Ginger. <laughs> are you, am I doing this? Oh, you are? Oh. <laughs> okay. I'll just say, uh, oh, yeah, I'll let you do it. Oh, I can't, it's not showing me anything, Gabe. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me tonight. Um, I am going to be introducing our the city's new communication policy and related procedures. Um, the goal is to brief you um, quickly. It's not going to. I'm not going to get into too much detail tonight, but I just want you to know what's coming down the pipe as um, the policy and the procedures are going to come to you in October. So um, yeah, this first slide. Um, sorry, <laughs> there we go, organize it. Okay, great. Um, so this first slide is our organization, no communication goals. So basically it touches on the main purpose of the policy and how it's, how we're going to integrate this policy policy into the work that we do as city employees. Um, consistency is the key to good communication, as we probably all know, and the best way to build public confidence. And I think now more than ever in local government with the use of social media and websites and everything else and so many different messages out there, we have to work a little bit harder to be consistent. Um, we want the public to know that they can rely on us when we put a message out on whatever initiatives we're working on, that it's gonna be timely, consistent, and effective. So this policy and these related procedures are gonna help um, tie that all in together. I should mention that we do have a number of kind of ad hoc policies and different things, and we are doing a lot of the work that's already in the policy and the procedures, but this just helps solidify it. So how do we achieve our goals? Um, we are, for, this is a great first step. We have our communication policy and procedures that you're all gonna see in a few weeks. And 
with that, um, with the eventual adoption of these, these policy and procedures and providing our staff with training and education on these materials, this is gonna allow that consistency. If we're all using the same materials and we understand the same processes, we're gonna have, um, we're gonna be more effective. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, the communications toolkit is um, in order for, oh, I'm sorry, just one sec here. I'm just gonna read my notes. To ensure our employees understand the policies and procedures, we're also, and also to introduce new techniques um, information, platforms, media channels, all those things that constantly are changing. We're gonna host a annual um, communications workshop uh, every January, um, mostly for our staff who do the forward-facing communications for us. That would be like development services, the youth center, um, actually almost every department has somebody in the organization who do, does a lot of that work. So uh, at any given time, we have 30 to 40 staff in here in, in our workshops. So, um, but for our uh, communications, it's not just about the people who are doing the forward-facing work, like putting things on social media. Our own staff, there's, there's a different level of communication, and that's the, our staff who talk to the public, deal with the public, things like that. So we'll make sure that they're also brought in the loop at, at some point, and that they're educated on this new um, policy and procedures. And also that when we have new hires, that there's a communications, um, component um, during the onboarding orientation. This includes everything from our internal communications, which we use Jostle, which is an internet platform, and also um, things like social media use and how we represent the city as ambassadors, um, as an employee, we're all ambassadors. So sometimes those conversations at the very beginning um, of somebody's uh, work life here are really helpful. So the, for the policy, the first step is to adopt the policy, and that's gonna happen in October. That's gonna help st staff understand our values and how these values will inform, influence, involve, and inspire the public through our communications work. The poli policy itself would need council approval, which is why it's coming to you. And if it were to be modified, it would also have to come back to you. However, the administrative procedures that are attached to it and they're about 15 or 16 pages long, they're quite detailed. And also the toolkit, what I'm gonna to touch on really briefly, those things are um, as staff, and not just me, as staff, we are able to modify those because um, everything changes, especially in the world of social media. I can't keep up with half of it. Um, and so, <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, so that's, um, um, it's very fluid and changing. And I just, we just need to be able to adapt. So that's that. Um, but the biggest takeaway, again, I'm just kind of like repeating myself, but the, from the policy is that we are consistent and by implementing the policy, hopefully we can remove some ambiguity in, in our roles and we know exactly who is supposed to do what. So as I touched on, we're, we're gonna adopt the administrative procedures to support the implementation of the policy. These procedures will govern all communication on behalf of the city with the public. The procedures provide a set of clear definition and processes for managing our communications. Everything from defining a spokesperson or who a spokesperson is to understanding the role of a staff person and how it relates to communicating to the public to managing social media commenting and more. And um, Social media actually plays a really big part in the um, administrative procedures. Um, and to be honest, it's, it, it may even be um, taken out and we might create just a very a standalone social media policy because it's um, part of our everyday for a lot of staff at the city. Um, the procedures provide detailed processes and how, uh, like on how and when to post, um, just taking the, the the how and why out of it for staff, just to make it, because um, it can be really tough. And uh, to be honest, I do a lot of the um, uh, commenting monitoring, and I definitely handle or stick handle the um, uh, more sensitive ones. So, so this is going to be a good opportunity for staff to to where we can where we can have staff deal more with the communications in their department as opposed to to maybe myself dealing with a lot of it. So. 
I'm not trying to do less. I just <laughs> spreading the wealth a little. Um, so also, as I mentioned on this slide, uh, these procedures apply to all employees and contractors. So any third party work we have done will be in accordance with this policy and procedures. And that's going to be really helpful as well. Again, it's going to help staff um, get out of a situation where we, they can just refer to the policy and not have to, you know, make any hard decisions themselves. So this kind of gets into the fun part. There's a, um, a communications toolkit that we, we have um, for staff. They have access to everything that you see on this list here. We're working on building a template bank um, for all the different departments. Um, again, the policy and procedure, which are, is coming. We've also been building an image bank for the city for the last um, five or six years. I even got a hard hat now and I get to go out and take more photos, so I'm really excited about that. Um, then we have a communications guide and checklist, a logo style guide or branding guide. We have a communications workflow chart, and we do have a social media flow chart, but that's a work in progress, so I won't be presenting that one tonight. But if you flip through, Gabe, I'm just going to quickly just kind of give people an idea of, of kind of the robustness of this whole package. Um, the policy is not a standalone document by any means, and it, it would actually not mean much if you just read the policy and then just left it at that. So a lot of our communication work over the last, all, all municipalities, not just us, all local governments, a lot of it's been um, off the side of our desks. and. And people know generally how to do things, but there's steps in between that sometimes get missed. And this communication workflow, um, if you look at it in detail, just gives the, the um, person creating the content uh, just more um, ability to know when and how to do something. And if they have questions, they know who to go to. So the department, or usually the department head would be the, the final uh, sign off. And a lot of what we do also flows through um, the city manager's, well, my, my office through the city manager. So, so we always have that lens of what council is um, wanting to achieve through the strategic plan and all their priorities. And this is the communications workflow, which ensures that staff are keeping that in mind when they're doing their work. Oh, this is a fun one. Um, so we created a logo standard style guide. Now you can't see very clearly up here, but people at home can. Um, all of these crests and logos um, are, I've just pulled off documents that we're currently still using in our organization. Staff send me things, um, it, anything from internal to external. So, so the what we're trying to do again is that whole consistency. And if you flip, kind of flip through, Gabe, um, we've created this branding uh, guidelines and logo guidelines. So now staff can see uh, what logos are approved by the city. And I actually have, we're on a little bit of a mission to to clean things up. And so, and everybody's been um, given this guide. If you keep flipping through, Gabe, you can just kind of um, slowly go through. You can see we have quite a few logos. Yeah, one more, Gabe. And, and knowing that it actually is an approved logo in the guide is going to be very helpful. And one more. Oh, OK, we're done with the logo guide. <laughs> um, this one here, um, just. It's, it, you can ignore the yellow highlighting, but we're just kind of introducing a few new platforms that we have. Um, I guess I just touch on them quickly. We have a chat bot now on our, our website if none of you have seen it, or hopefully you've seen it. Um, so that's helping with um, decreasing some of the uh, calls that we get because people can get their answers on the front of the website. But the, what this document is, it's actually a communications planning guide. And the purpose of this in the toolkit and related to the policy and procedures is to give staff, um, um, even, if, even if they just fill it out themselves and hold on to it, they're not missing a step. So we had the workflow, but this actually, it's not just about steps, it's about understanding your audience, about understanding why you're putting a message out and asking yourself questions as you go along. And also looking at there's so many ways to get a message out, to get our messaging out. So trying to find the ideal platform. So that's what this document's for. Um, the purpose is not for every single thing that we do at the city to have to do a, a planning checklist like this. It could be that we actually have to create a much bigger communications plan or um, they do it once, 
you know, they put they they know after the they everyone has to uh, get their leaves to the curb. After a while, you just they have a process in place and they know it. But this helps them um, get start off in the right direction. And this one's not much. This is actually something we've never had. And I think I think that this is um, taking everything that you saw, all the different media channels that we have and different platforms. And this is allowing staff to to actually check off what they've done and um, sharing that with others so that there's not redundancy. I think in any local government, one person's over in this office doing one thing. Meanwhile, that same thing's being done over here. So the goal of this, uh, especially for larger communications projects, is to help people or keep people streamlined and knowing that um, there's a budget, who's taking care of what and what actually has been accomplished. Okay, you can keep going. So something that's written in the policy is our deliverables. Um, and one of them is that um, we are going to, like I mentioned at the beginning, do a lot of training and workshops with staff more consistently. Um, you could see we'll have everything from subject ex expert lunch and learns, playing language training, which is really key. Um, I've done a lot of um, like power writing courses in different, and I'm working on my own degree in communications. and. Plain language is like one of the things they talk about more than anything. Um, so, and uh, I work with engineers and planners and there's lots of language that I have to kind of, or we all have to modify a little just, just to make sure that we're being uh, clear and effective in our communication. So anyway, I can kind of go through this. There's um, uh, a number of things that we can do with staff to make sure that they're up to date. Some of these things um, um, will be done annually, but we're also looking at creating um, a few videos so that we can share with staff. Um, they're already in, in the tank kind of thing, and we can, we can um, especially a new hire, you get a new hire in, in one department and there's not gonna be a big orientation or any training for a while, then we can share a video and, and get them to watch it. Um, so that's that's kind of the overall um, grand scheme of things. That's how it's all going to unfold, and this will be presented to you in a in its entirety. Um, so it'll be the policy procedures and the communications um, toolkit, which are basically uh, addendums to the to the policy. So looking forward, um, hoping that you'll adopt the policy. And we are, I mentioned uh, the email signature block policy. Um, that's gonna come possibly later, but um, just, I can touch on it briefly. Uh, we are creating a standardized approach to how, uh, for our communication, our, our email signature. So it's pretty straightforward. Most uh, government organizations have one. We're a little late to the game, but that will be coming maybe in, might be in November. So we'll, we'll, we'll keep working on that one. Um, and another thing I'm also trying to do, and, and I'm open to ideas on this, um, and hopefully if, if Kevin approves, um, we have a slideshow um, downstairs that's really effective, like phenomenal, because we not only get our audience of city people coming in for city business, but we also get uh, BC Public Service um, coming in. So whoever's walking into City Hall, it's, it's quite a vibrant slideshow. But the great thing is, is I can modify it at my desk, and so we could actually have... Um, screens in other locations in the community. So that's something that we are going to look at. Uh, but the big thing, and it's the question I probably get the most, is um, we have what's called a template-based uh, website through a company called Civic Plus. And we're, look, they, we're doing a refresh of the website in 2023. Yeah, <laughs> cheers. And um, yeah, I don't know how, how, how it's all going to unfold, but it generally takes a committee um, to, um, a refresh is not much different than actually creating a new website. Um, they are relatively inexpensive compared to some websites. So I do hear a lot because, you know, oh, we want it to look like Kelowna or this, but some of those sites are upwards of like $150,000, $200,000, and this is not, a, um, I don't know the exact price, but it's definitely less. So hopefully with a refreshed website um, using the same company, but with um, new modules and new technology in the last five years, we're hoping that we can really make it look good and um, work for the public. And um, yeah, and I guess that's it. <coughs> Thanks, Ginger. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions or comments? Councillor Woodward. Thank you, Councillor Lochtenberg next. Uh, thank you, Ginger. You're welcome. It's very exciting. <laughs> I like the refresh. Yes, I think everyone does. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so I was just wondering about, I was looking through the slideshow here and I was wondering about like emergency situations and, and whether or not there'll be a policy. Like for crisis communication? Yeah. Oh, that's a really good question. I ha haven't got quite that far. It is mentioned, it is part of the, um, the policy and procedures that you're going to see. Okay. It does have a, actually there is a pretty good chunk. Could we carve it out and do a standalone? Probably. Um, but I think, it want, and unfortunately, because you don't have the policy in front of you, you can't see what's being offered right now. But um, yeah, we can look at that. I'm just saying, because you know, we have the emergency operations center yep. and emergency manager, and to have this coordinated so that if we get to a sort of a certain break point with that, you know, the emergency of, let's just say, wildfire, yep. you know, it's up at a certain level. And then this kind of, there's a policy that works into what's going out to the public yeah and, and, we, quick we, and, and we do already have like systems in place so if they're for example i if i was to i move into the information or as the information officer into an eoc mm -hmm. which generally happens mm -hmm. um then uh one of my colleagues or designate actually moves into my role so city business continues as normal and then we're also um doing the crisis communication over here awesome yeah. thank you yeah uh, thanks for this, Ginger. I think we're all pretty um, keen to see this move forward. It's been something that's come up quite a bit over the last four years. One of the things I'm, I'm missing here that I think would be good to consider is our YouTube channel, yes. actually. And, yeah. and the reason why I think YouTube is potentially so important is because it provides more of a kind of a content library that, that is in many ways evergreen. It's a reference to go back to as opposed to Facebook and Instagram where yep. you, you tend to lose the feed, lose content in the feed. Yep. Um, and so what I would love to see is that we do have a really well curated YouTube channel with departments represented and, and, and some of that, the knowledge that we're creating for staff might be broadly applicable or broadly interested, in, interesting to the community. And so, so that would be great. And on top of that, I'm finding that our, our current subscribers to our YouTube channel is is really low, yes. so not not a big deal. Yeah. Um, but by bumping that up, you know, investing a little bit into build that subscriber base, then we can get into people's feeds. So when they're just bumping Absolutely. around on YouTube, yeah. they'll they'll discover a Nelson video that they might have otherwise missed. Yeah, and if you actually look at all of our platforms, we don't promote it, and so that's a big thing, right? Yeah. Um, to be honest, we've used it more as a repository for mm. holding videos, just like you said, um, and there hasn't it's mostly resources, but um, you know we've we've had to focus in on a few platforms, um, and none of our departments are really using YouTube, even though we actually do have a YouTube page. Um, I think that's a great idea. And, you know, as, as we hopefully have more resources, we can um, start to build on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and make a plan for it. Yeah, that, that would be great. Yeah. And, and I, I want to underline or emphasize why I want you to, would like to see you make this a priority is because I, one, YouTube as well is broadly available. Mm -hmm. Like you don't have to be a member. You can just access exactly. everything. Yeah. I find Facebook, there's many people in our community that have left Facebook, left Instagram, or never got on to it. That's right. And they're kind of left out of the conversation. And you could go watch our podcast. It's on our yeah, YouTube channel. Yeah, the podcast is on YouTube <laughs> channel. Maybe we'll too. get yeah. more viewers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think that's great. And if you've, Kevin has heard me for years. Um, video is my mantra, and I've talked about it a lot. But, you know, we're in local government, and sometimes getting people mm. to actually get behind the camera and every once in a while, we'll get a staff person who's really keen, and it's that's their thing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's a lot more that we could do for sure. Yeah, and, yeah. and to get over that, if I may, um, just the, the presentations that you bring to us, you don't have to be on the camera. You can record that presentation and do the voiceover, and then you, you're not in it. It's well-structured, yeah, and exactly. it's really useful. Yeah, we've done a few of them. Um, we use it was in our workshops and training. Um, one of the tools that our staff use now um, is Canva, which is an online graphic design tool. And we have the Pro, which is amazing. And we do, so many people are becoming incredibly proficient at it. We still use designers and I just want all of our graphic designers to know that we love them and they, they do much more complicated work for us. But um, in the interim, um, and th those are the kind of things that we do. And so we, um, one of the things is on Canva is you can actually do a presentation with, uh, and I've got a few staff who've done it. If you, some of our thought exchanges have have used them where it's a small presentation where the the person's head is kind of in the corner but they're talking over and and doing the presentation like that 
And it's a great way to even, they don't have to be super long either. And I think that's a good message for staff as well. It could be short and sweet. And, but you know, people want to know like what's going on here, what's going on here, like, or, and it's just a great way to update. But again, time and getting those, those people to do it. Like it's, it's not because they don't want to, it's just, there's a lot of other priorities. So we just have to um, um, come up with a plan. Thanks, Ginger. Thank you very much. That's it. <clears throat> My mum had a really good communications plan. She had a real nice voice like yours, and then she had a dish slot she used to have hanging over her shoulder when she really wanted to get attention of people. <laughs> <laughs> that worked very well. Bring my tarot. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you very much. So um, we have a Kevin, you're going to give us a brief report on our waste. Um, and for those of you who came tonight to talk to us about waste management, etc., you might be interested in sticking around for a few minutes. It'll be short and sweet. So, okay, um, I just wanted to, uh, you know, obviously this is a big issue in our our community, and certainly no one is is um, in our community wants to see bears destroyed. Um, you know, certainly. You know, it's clear our program isn't robust enough, especially in a year like this where Kevin, we're... Um, sorry, I'm hearing some people are saying they can't hear you. Is that right, Bill? Did you want to come up a little bit, Bill? Would that work? No, I, no, no. You're okay. All right. Yeah. Kevin, the clips are on my Okay. Louder would help. <laughs> um, yeah, as I said, no one's um, happy with the, you know, bears, bears being destroyed in our community. And, you know, clearly... Um, our program it is, isn't as robust as it needs to be, especially in a year like this when, you know, even bear smart communities like Castlegar have had a number of bears uh, destroyed. So what are we doing? Um, you know, you know, certainly as identified by others tonight, uh, we do have a, a waste management and wild attractant bylaw. It is quite robust. It was developed uh, in consultation with Wild Safe, B wild Safe BC. Um, you know, do we need to en enhance the enforcement? That probably is something that needs to be done. Uh, we have contracted with Wild Safe BC for a number of years, um, and they've worked with both city and community on reducing these attractants and making our community more bear smart. Uh, unfortunately, um, you know, our coordinator has changed a number of times over this last few years. Uh, when we had the coordinator was here based in Nelson, I think we had a lot more momentum and we've lost some momentum with uh, the coordinator not being in our community. Uh, we do have a meeting with the current coordinator tomorrow and, and we really need to look at how do we make that more effective. Um, we are replacing uh, the city, you know, as part of that um, strategy with the Wild Safe BC, we have been replacing um, our current uh, city waste receptacles with bear-proof bins. We've uh, recently replaced all the, the ones in Lakeside Parks, and our public works the director is uh, currently doing an inventory of um, all those that still need to be replaced, and he will be bringing that forward to council as part of a budget consideration for next year. Um, we have also increased the frequency of, of us uh, changing out the current um, waste receptacles uh, in all public places across the city. Any of our ones, we have really upped the amount of times we're changing those in the day. I believe they change them twice a day now. Um, you know, as also mentioned, council is committed to removing organics, food waste from our waste stream. Um, we have been working with both residents and businesses, and this is a priority of council. Uh, the residential pretreatment program uh, was initiated in 2020, showed a very high success rate in terms of diversion, uh, reduction of GHGs, and at a um, lesser cost than traditional um, wet uh, compost. Uh, we have been funded uh, for that program um, by uh, CBT, by the FCM, uh, and others, uh, as Cecilia mentioned, uh, we had a MITAC student through Selkirk College uh, working on that research of, of that program. Certainly Cecilia with her background um, uh, certainly has um, worked with other consultants and other experts to ensure um, it is a robust and, and it is based on 
um, you know, the best science out there. Uh, you know, the FCM grant also includes, uh, you know, a consultant that will work with us alongside that to make sure uh, the results are uh, what we um, believe them to be. Um, I think everyone knows that we're not solving climate change without technology. We, we can't use um, old solutions to, uh, to the problems we have today. So we will be rolling out that larger pilot. Uh, we should receive delivery of the first 1,600 units here this late winter, uh, uh, well, late 2022, or, um, and that should be starting to get rolled out. Um, as we know, as, as part of that, it, it is about $11,000 a week to collect. Um, and we've also had a really um, positive uh, pilot um, project on the uh, ICI side, the Institutional Commercial Industrial with Selkirk College. They're um, reducing a tr tremendous amount of, of, um, of um, food waste up there and are, are ecstatic about the, the program and the education to their students and chefs, et cetera. Um, so that's that's the work we are doing at present. Um, you know, we certainly have you know need to continue to work with the community. You know, I read our our wildlife attractant bylaws, and it covers like you're not supposed to you're not allowed to have a bird feeder from April fifteenth to December first. Those should not be in, be um, in anybody's yard at at this time of year. Uh, so there's a number of things that. You know that we as a community need to you know to pay attention to and do right and uh, like I said even in a community such as Kaskar you know it's a it's a challenge and you know maybe on trees you know I don't know what it, you know we may have to look at those fruit trees if you know we can um, I believe put in tree bylaws that um, I'm not sure if that allows you to remove trees if, if people aren't responsibly managing their trees um, but there's a lot of attractants as as residents, and this isn't a city issue only. I know um, one of our HR people said they have uh, have had a bear up on their their backyard out and out um, up the lake here, you know, every day over the next time. So it's we're, you're right. We we definitely live in a in a wildlife corridor, and it's going to take everyone to be really diligent to you know to make that but certainly the city is is going to review what we've what we're doing now uh, we certainly have to enhance that you know in a, in a number of ways thanks Kevin I think one of the key points there was uh, that we're all responsible for the solution here not just the the city um, and on that note um, I'm just notifying council that I'll be bringing forward a notice of motion to the October 25th, 2022 regular meeting requesting a review of the waste management strategy be included in the next council uh, setting, uh, priority setting session. And the reason I say that is because we're right against the election. We couldn't get that in before it, but it'll, the priority session happens right after the council's, uh, the new council are um, inaugurated. And it would include um, looking at weekly garbage pickup, containers, uh, just anything, just the whole program, so we can try and find a way to um, manage our waste uh, in a better manner. So we're not uh, we're not in a situation where we have to kill bears going forward. So uh, that motion will be coming forward to the next meeting uh, on behalf of myself as the mayor. And with that, um, I'd also like to remind the public that the regular council meeting. Uh, for Tuesday, October the 11th, has been 2022, has been rescheduled to October the 25th at 1 p.m., which enables Nelson and District um, uh, University Women's Club to host the All Canada's Forum on October the 11th at Central School. So the next meeting for October the 11th has been moved to October the 25th. And for the gentleman who came all the way in from Trums tonight, you're more than welcome to any time go up to the fifth floor of the City Hall here, speak with our climate and energy team, and get the real facts on the food sector. And Thank maybe you have some ideas you can offer up yourself. Uh, yeah, they so. can contact me because I, I made that clear that they, if, if they're interested in learning more about it, they can contact me as well. Okay, so with that, I'd like a motion to adjourn, please.
Oh, there's council reports. Council reports, yeah, absolutely. If you want to run through them, okay. Just a, go ahead. Just just a quick one um, for, on transit. Um, and this is, I, I wanted to get this one in before the election uh, because it could be an election issue in the RDCK. So if, if you're, you live in area E, F, or G, um, I would talk to your candidates about the transit, the BC's transit shelter program. Um, you know, this has been an issue at, in, on our 99 and our North Shore routes about the transit shelters that we have there. For some people, it just doesn't feel safe. Mayor's brought this up a number of times. Um, so in the BC transit shelter programs, municipalities assume 20% of the capital costs on these transit shelters. And that goes a long way to driving um, the priority setting for BC transit to build transit shelters. So if we want better transit, more convenient and safer transit, it's up to our regional partners to um, really make that a priority invest in that 20% on those uh, transit shelters and, and that'll help go a long way to getting new shelters. Uh, finally, on the electric buses, uh, this has come up a few times. There is a lar low carbon fleet strategy that starts in 2023. Now, unfortunately, BC Transit is prioritizing the capital region for all of the new buses. The rationale there is, you know, get a bunch of buses in one place because the charging infrastructure and everything else can be managed in one place, see how that goes, and then roll it out across the province. The West Kootenai Transit Commission or committee has, on behalf of the city of Nelson, unanimously supported Nelson getting an electric bus. Um, so that's gone up to BC Transit. We mentioned it again at UBCM. Um, the argument that we're making is that um, Nelson has something to offer here. You know, as a small community and in the interior, it's different than, than the coast and a big city. And so if Nelson gets an electric bus, then we're gonna be able to share that learning what it takes to run an electric fleet in a cold climate like ours. So <clears throat> fingers crossed that uh, we get some traction on that. Yeah, it's interesting, the minister said, why would you want one one bus? Why didn't you just get take a fleet? Yeah, yeah. I, I assume that they were all available. To well, everybody, but what you said about the capital area getting them, they're, they're which getting, makes sense, actually. Yeah, it, it, it does. The, the argument isn't that um, it, it's sound, I guess. Um, but two things, actually. The school districts are getting some electric buses, and that's kind of a different procurement process. So that's exciting. We may get electric school buses before electric yeah. transit. And it's a Canadian company that... Um, the low carbon fleet strategy is working with to acquire these buses. I think Proterra or something. So, and I thought you would mention Nelson started off with electric transit. Right. Yeah. That's yeah true. Exactly. With the streetcar. Right. <laughs> so we finish up with it too. <laughs> Nicole, did you have anything you wanted to add? No. Okay. Uh, Cal, you've been having fun out to Queens Bay there. Okay. <laughs> Jesse. Kid. I got a list. You got a list. <laughs> Get comfortable in your seat, guys. Uh, so I guess I'll start with the, uh, for the rest of council's benefit, the recreation commission has completed the, the review and workshopping with the facilitators to draft the, uh, new service bylaw for S226, the recreation bylaw. Uh, we saw a little bit of it in, in the letter of support going for Nelson soccer, uh, for, to conduct a feasibility study, a uh, feasibility study. Well, that, uh, has only been accepted for the first three readings by the RDCK. It, it's expected to be finally adopted on October 13th and is going to be a major refresh of those for S226. Um, I don't think Hasn't that the change was that significant to the bylaw. You're talking about going to the inspector of municipalities? Yeah. Now that you bring that up, I do think it flows through there. I'm not. Haven't had. I'd have to check that because I, I do remember Joe saying that our at our meeting about the minister had to accept it about having to maybe go through the inspectors. I mean, and the other thing is, is because of this process of it being the service review, it does have to loop back through the government before it's completely um, signed off. So there is a process Correct. there. Yeah, so that's... I think that we're going to... I think we still pass it. It comes and then it loops back and then it comes back in in another format. Like a big feature of that process was to capture the service as it currently exists and to map out what 
that was and to update the wording and create some clarity around how new services would be brought into it in the first place so that new new commissioners would be able to look at that in the future and, and have a clear understanding of and proponents would be able to come forward and have a clear understanding of what would be expected for expansion of that service or, or frankly, for that matter, contraction. Uh, but there's probably some nuances there that I certainly am probably not capturing. Um, I'll skip over some of these other things here, but of course, we all know that the alternative approval process for ARE funding uh, was not successful. Uh, the board is discussing next steps, uh, including how that might go out to a, a full or partial referendum, uh, RDCK board willing. So we're exploring those Across options. Page, you might want to say what it was for so that yep. we know what it was for, but maybe the audience doesn't. Sure. So obviously, uh, about 10 years ago, the areas E, F, and H, uh, I think it was 10 or 12 years ago, were consulted for a referendum on library funding. E was not successful. And so uh, the director in area E had opted to take it to an alternative approval process 10 years later uh, just to see if it was, I, as I would cat categorize it, a slam dunk or not. It was not a slam dunk, uh, but that doesn't mean the process necessarily ends there. But given that we're at the end of the term and the end of uh, Director Foss' uh, purchase on that particular issue, it's, it's kind of where it's sitting now until we know who the next director is going to be. Uh, but yeah, they're just as information and coming from as a trustee from that board that's what we're considering and what we're talking about uh and then the other big thing here is i've obviously since the last time we gave a uh, uh, council report been to a number of uh, community groups this summer uh, including the return of the gay pride event uh, and the parade and the various uh, sharing circles and and group community events that go along with that and there was a lot of a lot of uh, community coming together on that weekend, and it was a, a great, great return uh, for the city of Nelson, and, and it was great. I saw all of most of you there, so uh, it was kind of a wonderful thing. And so, other than that, uh, I will submit a written copy to staff for the minutes. Thanks very much, Councilor Morrison. So, um, just to follow up on a couple of comments that. Um, uh, Councillor Page has made in regards to so this is always the problem is that having two tables that you have to sit at and then seeing how it all flows out so as to my chagrin I have to say is that the uh, referendum uh, for the library the AAP uh, was reported out on and that it wasn't successful and it is the um, the pleasure of the RDCK board to take another action on that and unfortunately, um, I think I was, again, the only person that voted against it uh, was that the decision was to take no further action. So in terms of uh, the board uh, at this junction saying that they would like to investigate further, which would be most likely a referendum, um, that decision was made not to go forward. And my only comment at the table at that time um, was is that perhaps when the new board gets into place, and there's a new director in that area that other um, options uh, could be looked at in terms of looking at this again and whether or not it goes to a full uh, referendum in that area because it it does seem i mean there was conversation at the board table that that, that there was a number of people um, within that area that were quite keen to uh, become um, participants in the library through taxation and so it might be working with those groups and, and because you're the alternate at the RDCK, uh, I know that you and I have had the discussion about uh, whether or not that should be pursued uh, by people within the area, like the community um, gets behind it again and tries it and then almost sort of like pushes the hand of mm -hmm. the RDCK to, to look at referendum. Mm -hmm. So anyways, uh, the, the vote was, uh, the decision was no further action. So um, yeah. That sort of sums up their regional district, and um, we're all on the campaign trail. Okay, it's interesting because no one percent of the libraries in the province are not funded recently, and we happen to be part of that one yeah. percent. And I believe maybe Kinemat or Terrace is the other one. It's kind of interesting. Um, I know we'll have a report uh, back from staff about our meetings at the Union of BC Municipalities, and. We met with a number of ministers there, Minister of Forests, Minister of 
health, um, infrastructure, uh, environment, hydro, health, oh, we got health, uh, library, energy and mines, tourism, jobs and economic development. So we had a very full week down there meeting with the various uh, levels of government. And I just want a big shout out to our MLA, Brittany Anderson, who was with us at all of those meetings and was a real help in helping us to open some of those doors and reconnect with people we hadn't seen for almost three years in some cases. <coughs> and it, uh, I, think our, I think overall our meetings went very well and uh, quite receptive to some of her ideas and suggestions, especially the, the health minister willing to look at some of the challenges we're facing in, not only in Nelson but in rural BC in general and attracting doctors and so on. Um, with that, um, I'll just ask nobody else, you're all good? A motion to adjourn, please. Councillor Lochtenberg and Councillor Renwick, all in favour? Carried. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mayor. We definitely cancelled our hydro budget on Friday the 8th. Yes. Right? That's gone? Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be the 21st, I think. That's what I heard.